Hi, my name is Corey. I am an open source software engineer. Uh, I want to begin by apologizing. My talk contained another problems you didn't know you had yet, and I discovered that I cannot talk about more than one problem in less than 20 minutes. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about only dev random, and you can come and consult me if you want to find out what other problems you have that you don't know you have. <laughs> I charge very reasonable rates. <laughs> Just come get it. It's fine. <laughs> so in my day job, I work for Hewlett Packard Enterprise. I work in HPE's upstream team, a uh, team inside HP that focuses on open source software communities, making investments in those communities so that our customers, who unfortunately don't only use our software, uh, have lots of other excellent software that runs well on our own platforms. Uh, for my part, this means Python and HTTP almost exclusively. Uh, if you want to find me on social media, Twitter is the best place to go. Uh, that's because I don't want to give you my Facebook profile or my Snapchat profile. I don't want your snaps. Uh, find me on Twitter, send me messages there. Uh, that's all great. If you want to see the work I do, the work HP pays me to do, uh, I am extremely active on GitHub. You can find me there and you know, check that I'm not lying to HP about the work that I do. Uh, I would like to point out, however, that the various things I do for HP have exactly no bearing on the content of this talk. Uh, I am instead going to, uh, like any good conference speaker, opine on things that I am not an expert on. <laughs> uh, this talk follows on from a talk I gave on Thursday at the open day. That talk is not mandatory. Uh, if you know a little bit about how random numbers work in computing, then you will be totally fine. If you don't know, by all means, stay in this talk. I'm sure it'll be fun. But uh, you might want to see that talk that I gave back on Thursday. Uh, we did record it. It's available on YouTube. Uh, and personally, I think I did really well. So, <laughs> good viewing. So this fundamentally is the problem we're going to talk about. Uh, Understanding randomness at a pretty profound level as it affects computation turns out to be extremely difficult. Uh, I'm going to put my hand up right now and say that I don't pretend to understand it all myself. I'm not an expert. I am, at best, a well-informed, highly opinionated amateur. But as far as I can see, and as far as the literature uh, can tell us, the, the reason that randomness in computing is hard is fundamentally because a lot of the ideas are extremely confusing, and in some cases, downright contradictory. Uh, this necessarily means that many people who are not experts develop confused or downright contradictory understandings and ideas about randomness in computing. And not all of those non-experts are able to uh, properly evaluate that they are not experts, which means that they write their confused and contradictory opinions down in places that seem to be authoritative. This necessarily causes people who know they aren't experts to read the confused and contradictory things that are in the authoritative place and themselves develop confused and contradictory ideas. And we get a nice little cycle of a whole lot of people not understanding the problem, uh, or worse, understanding it incorrectly. So this is the theme of this talk. The damage that is caused by incorrect knowledge, in general, in computing, is extremely large. The damage that is caused by that in security context is extremely high. I love this quote. This quote is my favorite example of irony in the whole world. It was put up at the start of the movie The Big Short last year and attributed to Mark Twain. Mark Twain never said this. <laughs> not once, not ever. But the movie's extremely confident that he did. Uh, I find that to be exceptionally amusing. <laughs> All right. So I do have a few quick definitions before we get too far into this. Uh, most of these are rehashes from my previous talk, but I need to, to go into them. Uh, CSPRNG and PRNG. I'm going to use these acronyms throughout this talk because saying the full phrase that they stand for is going to take too long. Uh, PRNG is pseudo random number generator. This is a device that, or a software device, an algorithm that, using some amount of persistent state, generates a sequence of randomish numbers. A cryptographically secure pseudo random number generator is like that, but its state is massive. And so it generates random numbers that are randomish enough to be safe for use in cryptographic contexts. They're super complicated. Uh, you need a math degree to write one. Please don't write one. If you don't have a math degree, just use the ones that everyone else has already written. Entropy is the other term, and this one is trickier. Uh, entropy, in this context, has nothing to do with physics. If you studied physics, forget everything you know about the word entropy, because like any good word, we've used it to name a whole ton of unrelated stuff. I'm talking about Shannon entropy, informational entropy. 
Uh, you can define this in a couple of ways. Uh, the best way to describe it is it is the amount of irreducible information contained in a stream of data. Put another way, if you were to compress data perfectly, this is the limit to how compressed that data can get. If a data stream has 12 bits of entropy in it, then you can compress it to no, more, uh, no fewer than 12 bits of data. For the case of randomness, entropy is usually defined as the amount of randomness either in a stream of data or in a system. Don't worry, if that definition was confusing, everyone else is confused too. It's totally fine. So let's talk about dev random. Firstly, who in the room knows what dev random is? All right, we got a decent number of hands, but for those that don't, dev random is one of a pair of what uh, are known as virtual devices. They exist in Unix-like operating systems on the file system. Anyone with a laptop in front of them that isn't running Windows can find these on their file system. You can do a little ls in slash dev, and they'll pop right up. It's one of a pair. Its friend is called dev uran. Both of these virtual files are sources of random numbers. Specifically, they provide file-based access to a random a CSPRNG that is inside your kernel. They behave like files. If you wanted to read from them inside Python, you can totally do that. You can do it with open dev random and do some reading. They are heavily, heavily used in programming because they are the only cross-platform way to get access to the kernel CSPRNG. There are many platform-specific ways to do it, but these two are the only way to get at the kernel CSPRNG. I was previously going to talk about why kernel CSPRNGs are good and user-space CSPRNGs are terrible, but I don't have time. Come up afterwards if you'd like to hear me complain some more. But we have two devices. Why do we have two devices? The answer, relatively obvious answer if you think about it, is that they behave differently, right? We wouldn't have two devices if they were exactly the same. That would be silly. So they do something different. And to talk about what they do different, we're going to consider Linux. And this is because Linux implemented these devices first. It invented this way of getting random numbers. I don't know about you, but when I don't understand something on Linux, I type the man page, and then I get the wrong man page, and I have to remember what number I need to get the man page I wanted. <laughs> Uh, you want man for random. <laughs> I'm sure you could have guessed it was for. <laughs> right, this is the wordiest slide I have. I apologize. I have tried to cut out as much of the manual page as possible because it's long, uh, but this is from the manual page for random. I will read it to you. It says, when read, the dev random device will only return random bytes within the estimated number of bits of noise in the entropy pool. And then it says a whole ton of other stuff. And then it says, when the entropy pool is empty, reads from dev random will block until additional environmental noise is gathered. Now this paragraph is important because this explains the distinguishing behavior between dev random and dev random. It doesn't actually say that that's what it's explaining, but that's what it's explaining. The random device will block sometimes. The way this works in practice is your kernel sits there on its little laptop gathering random data from the environment and saying, oh, this is worth a fraction of a bit of randomness credit. Uh, and it keeps track. It's got a little counter in the kernel saying, this is roughly how many bits of randomness I think I have gathered. When you read from DevRandom, you consume some number of bytes out of it. The kernel decrements that counter. It says, you got eight bytes of randomness, so you have taken eight bytes of entropy out of the pool. If that counter drops below the amount of data you've requested, the random device will refuse to return you data until it got, has got more. This is not true of dev uRandom. This is the difference. uRandom will return random data forever. If you want to test this, you can cat the various random devices into your terminal, and you'll notice that dev random stops. Please don't do it <laughs> with dev random. Do it with dev uRandom. It's fun. Your terminal will beep at you a whole lot. Don't do it with dev random. If you actually enter, be, enter uh, empty dev random, you might find that your system starts behaving unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we can summarize this idea in another way, right? Dev random, fundamentally, its behavior is predicated on the idea that it has a fixed amount of random that it can give you, and when it you've taken it all out, it has to wait for a while till more comes. It's like a little pot where a truck comes over and dumps random into it, and it distributes the random to you. And when it's out, what are you going to do? There's no more random. I don't know. <laughs> Dev random, on the other hand, is like a little store where the random comes in, 
And there's some amount of random maybe, but it just keeps giving it out. It's like Amazon, you just go, where are they storing it all? I don't know. Like, there's presumably a place, but I think maybe they just magic it out of the ether. <laughs> so if I was going to phrase the design ethos of this distinction between devices, the de design ethos says you can run out of entropy. There is some way in which entropy can be constructed such that it is consumable. You take it, you move it around, it exists in one place, and then it leaves that place and goes to another place. This is an interesting idea. I would argue that this idea is not self-evidently true, right? We can examine this idea, but it's not just like the sky is blue as a level of idea, right? Philosophers, please don't get at me for that. I'm going to argue this does not stand up to scrutiny, and the first way I'm going to do this is to point out that Linux has a very special idea here. It turns out that Linux is the only operating system which acknowledges this distinction. On every other Unix-like operating system, devrandom and devurandom behave in exactly the same way. And when I say exactly the same, I do mean literally exactly the same. You can go grab the source code. The reads are the same function call. They are exactly identical. If you have a Mac in front of you, you may catch dev random into your terminal now. That is, you are free to do so. If you have a BSD, also, go wild. It's totally fun. Every other Unix-like operating system gets rid of this distinction altogether. And the random devices behave exactly the same way. And this is because the idea that is predicated, that dev random is predicated on, makes no sense. This idea is fundamentally that if you're maintaining some pool of randomness, then hashing it and giving that value to the user is somehow more effective or more random than using a CSPRNG, which is what devurandom does on Linux. It has this idea that there is some kind, somehow a better, truer kind of randomness that you get out of devrandom and that it needs to ration that out because it's a scarce resource, like rare earth metals, right? The problem is, there is no evidence for this idea at all, and quite a lot of evidence against it. It is, in principle, somewhat possible that the hash of the entropy pool that comes out of devrandom is, has higher entropy in it than the output of devurandom initially. Like, if you've never used either device when you boot your system and you read eight bytes from each, probably the entropy level in the first eight bytes out of devrandom is higher than the entropy level in the first eight bytes out of devurandom. But once you've been running the system for any length of time, this notion just breaks down entirely. The reason it breaks down entirely is because the CSPRNG in the Linux kernel is based, of down, based upon the same basic principle as a stream cipher, as a cryptographic cipher, specifically ChaCha20. It is, in fact, ChaCha20. So this idea that you could somehow run out of randomness if you wanted to is a bit like the idea of saying you could run out of key when you encrypt some data. Like you start saving, you type in your little password into TrueCrypt, you say, yeah, my password is password, and you get some key out of it, it's going to be 256 bits long, and TrueCrypt runs for a while, and when it gets to the 16th gigabyte of your disk, it goes, I've run out of key, I'm going to have to wait for a while till I get some more key from you. Please can you type more password into me? <laughs> but this, this idea doesn't stand up to any scrutiny at all. And that is fundamentally because Entropy, in this context, Shannon entropy, is not a consumable resource that you can run out of in a pool. A given amount of data has some entropy in it. When you add another byte to the end of a stream of data, the combined stream of data cannot have less entropy than it did before you added the byte to it. You cannot take information away by appending bytes at the end of a previous stream of information. This is simply mathematically not possible. This means that it doesn't matter how many bytes of random data you pull out of a CSPRNG, the total entropy of that combined stream of data cannot possibly go down. The entropy per byte can go down, and there is a very reasonable security argument to make there. But the idea that you have to stop emitting data altogether the second you have consumed your first n bits of entropy does not make sense. Another way to describe this is that a kernel CSPRG or any CSPRG is an entropy stretching device. If you have 256 bits of entropy in the state for your kernel CSPRG, 
then what the CSPR engine will do is stretch those 256 bits of entropy over its combined output data. That is all that it does. It doesn't take the entropy away from inside the CSPR engine. CSPR engine doesn't lose that entropy. It's just reusing it over its set of subsequent output. No other operating system has this misbehavior in it. I should note that while the way all other OSs behave is that their random devices block at boot time. So when you first turn on your machine before it has generated any entropy from the environment, or gathered, not generated, gathered any entropy from the environment, it will refuse, both devices will refuse to give you any random data. Then, when it has gathered its first certain amount, usually up between 128 and 256 bits of entropy, they will then generate output until you turn the machine off again. They will never refuse to give you data. Most sensible operating systems attempt to preserve this entropy pool over reboot. Linux, by default, does not. That requires user space uh, assistance. On Linux, neither device behaves this way. Random does its weird little going on strike thing that it does. Uh, but uRandom also doesn't behave the way the random devices on other OSs do. And this is because, subtly, uRandom will produce output the second it is instantiated on the file system. This means that if you're running in boot time, the uRandom device pops onto the file system, and it, the kernel may have gathered no entropy from the system, from the environment at all, but it will quite happily feed you data from uRandom. It will just print a little log, a little warning in the boot log that says, you read it from uRandom, I didn't have any randomness, I just guessed. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably fine, but who knows? I hope you checked your boot log. Bye. Um, <laughs> this is a terrifying failure, right? Like, if you've written software that expects to get good random numbers, and someone decides to run <coughs> in the middle of the boot process, they might not get good random numbers. My boy, I sure hope that no one runs SSHD during the boot process, because that would be quite bad. Both of these behaviors are silly. And they cause real problems. So the most famous example is a Ruby bug. And I want to stress, I'm not picking on Ruby. There is nothing that singles out the Ruby developers here. It's a very common misunderstanding. This is Ruby bug 9569. Go look it up. The bug was that Ruby had a class called secure random. And that secure random class used OpenSSL's random number generator. If it couldn't find OpenSSL's random number generator, it would fall back to DevU random. The bug said, this is silly, we should prefer DevU random because the kernel random number generator is always more secure than OpenSSL's. This is factually true. OpenSSL's random number generator is seeded from the kernel random number generator. It definitionally cannot be more secure than the kernel random number generator. However, the bug was closed with no change. Ruby, to this day, as far as I'm aware, still prefers OpenSSL's random number generator. And they did this because of the advice in the Linux manual page, which says that devu random must not be used to create initial keys or seed state. That statement is again predicated on the idea that what dev random does is somehow better than what devu random does. The problem is that the Ruby developers are not experts in this field. They are not experts in randomness and entropy, and nor should they have to be. There should not be a bar that says you must understand randomness at least this well to program or create a programming language. That is silly. I don't know how to create a programming language. I don't think that I should have to. Neither do I think that everyone should have to know how to uh, understand randomness. The advice on the Linux manual page makes no sense. I can tell you that it makes no sense because they have recently added a workaround. This is a new syscall in the Linux kernel. It's called get random. And get random does exactly what you random does on every other operating system, which is it blocks at startup till it's initially seen in the pool, and then it goes forever. You can give it flags to make it behave either like the stupid dev random or the stupid dev you random, but by default, it behaves like the sensible dev you random that everyone else has. The reason they've added a new syscall rather than change the file system is because changing the file system could break user space applications, and Linux does not break user space. That is genuinely it. There is no plan to change for the user space file devices in Linux. Given this is PyCon, I should make a quick note on Python. Uh, and the quick note is, how do you get good random numbers in Python? This is your actual bit of advice. I've ranted at you. Thank you for humoring me. Here, I will teach you something, and then you can all go and feel like I didn't totally waste your time.
for any situation where you need random numbers that you can get the same right, set of random numbers again. If you're running a simulation, if you are running rendering video game levels, if you need to save the state for any reason. Essentially, if it's not for a security reason, if no user's ever going to see it. Random.random .random is fine. That's totally fine. This situation, despite what you all think, is extremely rare. Almost none of you need to do this. You should actively consider using random.random .random. anytime you see random.random .random in your code base. Hell, anytime you see import random in your code base, you should think very, very hard about whether you really, really meant this, because probably you didn't. For every other use case, you should use these things. This is your rough priority order of randomness. If you are lucky enough to have a Python 3.6, then you can use the secrets module. To what I imagine will be many people's surprise, the secrets module in Python is actually the only part of the standard library that promises to be good enough for cryptographic purposes. Nothing else makes that promise. The secrets module is fag. You should use it. If you don't have access to Python 3.6, which is almost everyone in the room, because it's not out yet, uh, <laughs> I mean, you can build it. It's fine. But either random.systemrandom or os.urandom are your best bets. I've put them in this order. It's not a strong order at this time, because random.systemrandom just calls it os type random. Right? It's the same thing. But the kernel, uh, the Python core maintainers have made it very clear that they believe that os.urandom should always do exactly what the urandom device does. It cannot diverge from that behavior to be more secure. However, random.systemrandom is free to do whatever it likes. So I'm giving you this advice in the possibility that I might have to stand up in front of you all in 12 years with a much larger beard and say that, turns out, OS.Urand, totally flawed, their Urand is terrible, don't use it, we found this other cool new thing, uh, go use that. Random on sister random, very slightly better. It's also worth taking a look at PEP 524. PEP 524 is entitled, Make you random Blocking on Linux. Uh, it is a proposal to diverge from this promise made by the Python uh, core developers. This pet, and much more importantly, the discussion behind this pet, uh, are an excellent example of what happens when you have uh, people using advice that is flawed coming from things like the Linux manual package. All right, I'm done. I'm done ranting at you. You can ask me any questions you would like. Uh, you can also feel free to tell me that I'm an idiot. But like, wait till the audience is gone, uh, because I'd like to save some space. Thanks. <laughs> That's good. Testing, testing. Thank you, Corey. That was probably uh, the best Lonely Hearts column entry. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, the most concise man for random. Very good. Yes. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Thanks very much for this all. You mentioned man for random. How did you work out for? How should you work out for? <laughs> <laughs> Here's what I did. I, I don't ever actually look things up in the Linux kernel menu page. I open Google and I type man random. And then I look for the results, I saw two. It was man random parentheses two and man random parentheses four. I opened parentheses two, it was wrong. I closed it, I went back to parentheses two. <laughs> I think the actual answer is that four is to do with like devices and two is to do with like uh, libc. The other answer is you can use apropos to tell ah. you where to, it's like a search of. Do what Tom said, I didn't even know that existed. Apropos, mm -hmm. random, or whatever you're searching. Another question? Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I was wondering, um, these issues that we might have at the boot time uh, for the lack of randomness, are they uh, particularly relevant in case of Docker uh, containers or uh, any other form of uh, virtualization? Uh, they are for virtualization, they aren't for Docker. So uh, I didn't get to talk about it. The kernel CFPRNG is awesome in part because it can handle Docker correctly. So it will make sure that different Docker containers don't uh, start seeing the same random numbers. That, which you could get, which does happen in old versions of OpenCLP fork. Um, that is uh, exactly as silly as it sounds. Um, however, for virtualization, it is an enormous problem. If you spin up a brand new cloud machine, you, know, you go to AWS and you type, give me a new VM, please, that VM has to harvest randomness from somewhere in order for you to log in. SSH requires that you be able to negotiate a random session key. Uh, there's no good way to get it. Uh, Ubuntu, by default, you'll be all delighted to know, uh, goes and asks Canonical for some random. 
Uh, <laughs> now, canonical does GPT sign the random, so it definitely asks canonical for random, but you can decide how much you trust canonical versus anybody else. It is a huge problem. Thanks a lot. Um, you mentioned that uh, <coughs> uh, Linux added a special system called Get Random. Uh, do you know why that was decided? They decided to do that rather than just a third device called, I don't know. Good Random? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Uh, you would have to ask Theodore So, who is the uh, owner of the various random uh, interfaces to the kernel. I don't know. I never asked that question directly. Presumably to avoid proliferation of devices. Oh, no, I do know why. I'm sorry. I do know why. Uh, opening the random device requires that you have a file descriptor, which means that if you have hit your unit of file descriptors, you cannot actually open any of the device files to get random numbers. This makes the, this will produce the possibility of a DOS attack on systems that need random numbers, uh, which did affect Python. So uh, the get random syscall fundamentally exists uh, in part to avoid the need to get a file descriptor to get random numbers. Sorry, I just had to rephrase the question in my head. Any more questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what I had to. I'm really enthusiastic. You'll, you'll be able to find me afterwards. I'm not going in. Well, I mean, I'll go to lunch eventually. Um, with a CSVRNG, can you literally generate numbers forever and it won't, you can never work out what the C was or anything like that? Uh, yes to the first part and no to the second part. Um, if you generate enough random numbers from a CSPRNG without ever feeding it more entropy, yeah, you can predict it. It's got a fixed state, and given enough time, you can work out what's going on. Uh, the kernel CSPRNG, again, is awesome because it is constantly reseeding itself with environmental data. It is extremely hard to predict the output of a kernel CSPRNG unless you own the entire network that it's on and, ideally, the colo in which it is based at which point you can control the entropy inputs. This is, as far as I know, a theoretical attack against the CSPRG, but the NSA, who knows, right? <laughs> Any more questions? Who got lost? It is lunchtime, so anyone who isn't enjoying a quick Q&A should probably feel free to leave. Um, so some processes have uh, the built-in, uh, potentially doped, random number generator. Uh, isn't Linux using this now? And so, nine will block because it can just use that? No. Uh, yes and no is the answer. So yes, it is using the built-in random number generator sometimes, but uh, it sometimes isn't. And as far as I know, it still maintains the entropy counter in the kernel. Uh, so it does some weirdness. I am going to be entirely upfront here and say, I saw a little bit in the kernel source that said HWRNG, and I went, nah, not doing that. Uh, there is an implementation. I would love it if you would go and look at it and then tell me <laughs> so that the next time someone asks that question, I can say something more sensible. Uh, cool, thanks. So, so we have the interpret all the way down problem because in the past we were told this is quite safe, you can use it, and then of course we're told no, you should never have used that, you should have not have trusted us before. And now we're in the same situation where the new CSPRNG is quite safe, we can trust that, and that's all fine. Um, so given all of the above, is it a reasonable scenario that it's good enough for what we're trying to do? And I can't, given, given that it still has to reseed by gathering entropy, if I need a lot of random numbers in a very short space of time, can I compromise it by whatever? <laughs> yeah, all right, let's call that two questions. The yeah. first one is about the generalized security, and it's a more broad question, right? It's, Someone who claims to be a security expert stands up in front of you and says, this is the secure way to do things. What that sentence always means from anyone who's not a snake oil salesperson is, as far as we know, stood today with the best tools we have available to us, this is the best you can do. I will put my hand up right now and say, anytime I've ever given anyone security advice, that security advice is as good as I can give you in this moment right now. I will almost certainly look back on security advice I have given within the last week in five years' time, and I'll look at that and go, that was dumb, that was dumb, oh, so bad. Um, security is a constantly evolving uh, problem. It, you, you cannot assume that once you've written some code and it was secure at the time you wrote it, that it will stay secure for all time. It probably won't. If you are the kind of person who wants to make as few code changes as possible, then I strongly advise you get out of anything that requires security code, because you are going to change it for the end of time, or become weaker over time. Those are our only two options. 
The second question was about, if I need lots of random numbers really fast, can I uh, make my random numbers more predictable, essentially? Uh, and the answer is yes. It's the same as if you can control the entropy inputs, you can make the random numbers more predictable. There is a fixed rate at which the kernel will be able to reseed uh, the entropy pool. It is different for every machine, based in part on the hardware random number generators and local chips, also on network traffic, etc., etc. But at a certain point, you will be able to generate, you could generate random numbers fast enough that it makes it possible to explore the internal state of the system. That attack, again, is theoretical. No one, as far as I know, has been able to pull it off. If I was able to pull it off, I would be much wealthier than I am now. Or, no, I'd be a good person, and I wouldn't sell it to the NSA. I would write a paper, and I would remain poor. <laughs> <laughs> That's lunch. That was the round of applause. Actually, let's give Corey one more big round of applause.